praise the Lord. Before we get going, my wife said she believes that she has some. Guys, can you give me some juice on this one? There it is. Came to me while we were singing. I will prophesy the promise. If I were to tell you that, listen, when I go, Becky, you can have my shoes. Or you could have a piece of jewelry or whatever. That's just words. But if I have that in a will, you have a paper document to back that up. You have a paper document. It's called the Bible. God says he will never leave you nor forsake you. That belongs to you. He says, I am the Lord thy God that healeth thee. That's for you. He's, uh, the word says, 1 Peter 2, 24. By his stripes you were healed. That is for you. That is your document. That is the will of, the real will of God in paper form. And he knew all those years ago when this document was being written out that you would need those documents, those promises of God that are contained within his word. That is his will, and that is his will for you. Amen. Just keep right there. <clears throat> so I'm going to preach to you up here today. That way, in case the spit gets to flying or anything. <laughs> if you have a Bible this morning, I'd encourage you to open it to the book of Matthew, chapter 16. So, um, I think this is very appropriate to where we've been as well. And before we get started, let me also remind you that we are, our endeavor is to soon, as soon as we can, we'll, we, you know, we miss children's church, we miss. Uh, being able to provide nursery and things of that nature. And in the meantime, we do have, as many of you know, we have the uh, nursery um, room open if someone comes with a child and they need to uh, comfort their child or minister to their child, they can do that. Um, but uh, we're, we're looking forward to being able to offer all the things that we would normally be able to offer it as a church. So that, that's going to come. So just be, be patient. We'll get there. We've got to take a step at a time. And uh, like I said, whether we opened up next week, two weeks from now, three weeks from now, I'm like, what will change? What's going to change in the next three weeks? We've got to start. We've got to get going. We've got to get back to, and, in, and as we do, other people I know that are maybe a little more compromised, things will settle down over some time, and it'll be, it'll be fine for them as well. Um, so let's, let's look at Matthew chapter 16. Verse 13, I'm going to start there. Very familiar passage of Scripture. I love this passage. Let me read just a little bit here. It says in verse 13, When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that you're John the Baptist, some say Elijah, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he said unto them, But who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered, and he said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered, and he said unto them, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood is not revealed it unto you, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto you that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then charged he his disciples that they should tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ. So what happens here is Peter gets a revelation from God that Jesus is the Christ. Now, Peter had a certain mindset, though, about what that meant. He had an idea as to what that meant, and it wasn't the same thing that Jesus knew that was the revelation of, of him being the Christ. It wasn't the same thing that Jesus had. In his mind. Let me keep reading just for a couple more verses. He said, From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again from the third day. So Jesus actually told his disciples, I have to go to Jerusalem. 
I will suffer many things. I'll be killed, but I'll be raised on the third day. But you know they weren't listening a bit. Do you ever notice people don't really listen that well? You can talk, and then and, and I've been guilty of the same. I am guilty of the same thing. Sometimes Lauren will tell me something, and then she'll say, did, did you? She can just tell, I guess, that I'm looking, but I'm not there. And she'll say, did you hear what I said? And I'm like, uh, can you say that one more time? This is really what was taking place here. Then Peter took him, and he began to rebuke him saying, Be it far from me, Lord, be it far from you, Lord, this shall not be done unto you. So Peter says, Whoa, wait just a minute, what are you talking about? What are you talking about that you're going to go to Jerusalem and you're going to be killed and be raised? And what, what's that about? No, we can't do that. that no, that, that's not the plan. That is not what, what's supposed to happen. So Peter has a different idea as to what Jesus' life was supposed to end up being. Or else he would have said, glory to God. When does this happen? Let's get to Jerusalem. Could The quicker we can get you, you know, in that environment so that they can crucify you and kill you and raise you back from the dead and mankind would be redeemed, the quicker we do that, the better, right? Wouldn't that have been his thought? But no, he says, whoa, this can never happen. And then Jesus got to the place where he actually had to tell him, uh, uh, Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me, for thou savorest not the things of God, but those that be of men. So in other words, Peter has this wonderful revelation that Jesus is the Christ. And literally, literally, seconds later, he's being told, Satan, get behind me, Satan, and look, and as he's looking at Peter. How does that work? I mean, you get a revelation from God, and then all of a sudden you're being told, you're being called Satan. Is because Peter really didn't understand. And he didn't want to understand at the time. He, didn't, he just doesn't get what the plan of God really was being unveiled and what was being told to him. So the entire time, I'm going to say a phrase till you turn over to Luke chapter 22. I'm going to use a phrase throughout this message. And I want it to kind of just resonate with you. I want it to get inside of your head. Because I think this is kind of where we're at as well. Luke 22, we'll start with verse 54. I want to put a phrase inside your head, so what now? You, you have ever been in a situation where you've done all that you can do and then you, you kind of go, so, so what do I do now? So what, what, what now? Where, where do we go from here? And that's kind of almost, it feels that way with this as well. So, so what's next? Like I said, if I thought three weeks from now that you would be dramatically safer, like if there was a, something that was an underlying thing that we could go, oh, that'll, that's the di- oh, there's the difference, I'd wait three more weeks if I thought that really exists, that, that place was going to exist. But what's going to be that much different? So where do we go now? What do we do now? We've, we've had an uproar. I mean, we, and we've had like, you know, some, some real change in our life. We've had, uh, our lives basically are nothing like what we're used to seeing. So, so what do we do now? Are we to coil up and, and, and to, to basically just say, listen, we've got to make sure that this is all about us. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm all in favor of being precautious. I'm all in favor of us being safe. I'm all in favor of you being using wisdom and, and those kind of things. Don't, please don't misunderstand me. Use the wisdom. We're going to do the things that we believe are, 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 are helpful and beneficial. But where do we go from here? What are we going to do from here? Do we, do we just stop? Do we get so used to, to being out of church that, that I, I could continue to give you video messages and you could stay at home? Well, that'd be totally contrary to what the Bible has to say, wouldn't it? Didn't the Bible say something like, a forsake not the assembling of yourselves together? There was a purpose, there was a reason, everything. Don't just think for a minute that somehow or another that Jesus wasn't sure what to say or, or the inspiration of the Holy Spirit coming upon men didn't really know what to say, so they just said, well, let's, let's use some filler time. Or let's just say some things. Every word is said with a purpose and a, and a meaning. Everything is said. There's no accidents in the Bible. Everything has a purpose. Everything was said with intent. And so when he said, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together, there was a purpose in him saying that. He knew that we need each other. 
We need the encouragement of each other. We need to have fellowship. We need to build upon each other's faith. We need to, to, to be able to see how things are going in other people's lives and be a, a, a lift to them because every now and then you need a lift. And so he knew that. You can't quite get that on a video, right? I mean, hopefully we were uplifting and hopefully some of the message is a bit encouraging. Uh, but at the end of the day, there's nothing like being here. So, so what now? Well, they were asking the same question. I believe that Peter, when they went through this, look at, at Luke chapter 22. I'll come back to that thought here in just a minute. Look at verse 54. It says, Then uh, took they him and led him and brought him to the high priest's house, and Peter followed afar off. And when they had kindled a fire in the midst of the hall and were set down together, Peter sat down among them. But a certain maid beheld him as he sat by the fire and earnestly looked upon him and said, This man was also with him. And he denied him, saying, Woman, I know him not. And after a little while, another saw him and said, Thou art also of him. And Peter said, Man, I, I am not. And about the space of an hour after another confidently affirmed, saying of a truth, This fellow was also with him, for he's a Galilean. And Peter said, Man, I know not what you say. And immediately while he yet spake, the cock crew, and the Lord turned and looked upon Peter. And Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said unto him before the cock crow, You'll deny me three times. And Peter went out and wept bitterly. I imagine at this moment, Peter is now watching the Lord, getting ready to be crucified. He's watched him be captured, just like Jesus had told him would happen. And now he's actually watched it happen, but yet it wasn't what he had in mind. He thought that somehow or another Jesus was going to set up some kind of earthly kingdom. He was going to be an earthly king. And that's what he had in his mind. And when it didn't happen and when he actually watched Jesus being captured, saying he would be captured, then watch him get captured and then watch him get crucified. I imagine the thought was going through his mind, so what now? Where do we go from here? What are we going to do now? Because they've had a leader. They've had someone that has told them what to do. They followed, even though they didn't always listen so good. But they've had their leader, and all of a sudden he's gone. So now they're like, what now? What, what do we do now? Look over to uh, John, John chapter 19. I'm going to have to do a little... Uh, picking and choosing here. I've got a lot of scripture and I just don't think I'll have the time to get through it all. So let me do a, a little picking and choosing. John chapter 19 verse 23 said, Then the soldiers, when they'd crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts to every soldier apart and also his coat. Now the coat was without seam, woven from top throughout. And they said there among themselves, Let, let us not rend it, for, uh, but cast lots for it. Whose shall that, whose it shall be, that the scripture might be fulfilled, which saith, They parted my raiment among them, and for the vesture they did cast lots. These things, therefore, the soldiers did. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Cleopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and his disciples standing by, whom he loved, he saith unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. And uh, then saith he to his disciple, Behold thy mother. So in other words, he was talking to his mother, saying, John is now your son, and John now she is your mother. In other words, you're going to take, I'm asking you to take care of them. But as his mother st stood there and, and watched, and as the, the other people that had followed Jesus' ministry that weren't per se his disciples, but people that were following his ministry, and then there's John and they're watching him be crucified, and then just within a, a short time after that, we, you know the story where it, it, it'll tell us that he took his last breath, you know, and then they watch him literally die. I imagine they were saying, so what now? Because after all, you follow somebody so far, or you follow something so far, and then it changes. Our world has kind of changed a little bit. And it would be easy for people to look and say, so what now? How has our world been changed? What does that, how does that affect us? What are we going to do from here? What, what's going to happen? That's what they were thinking. That's what they were seeing. So what do we do now? Where do we go from here? What does our world look like now? And so those thoughts had to be going through their mind. 
and then they had to put action to whatever it was after the, after Jesus' death because they, they have to do something, right? For three and a half years they followed him. Everywhere he went, they 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 you know, he he went around and, and ministering the gospel and sharing with people, healing people, touching people, just changing people's lives. And his disciples and others were right there the entire time watching and observing all the things that he would do. And then all of a sudden that's gone. Nothing else. I mean, what, what, it's like waking up one day, you know, you, you've been with somebody for a, a lifetime or a long time, and then one day they're not there. Many people that lose loved ones, they, they go through, through the same thing. What now? What does my life look like? What am I supposed to do? I don't know what to do. I don't know how this is going to look. So what now? Now look over in John chapter 21. Jesus begins to reveal to them the answer to the question of, so what now? So what's going to happen? So Peter, as, as you know, Peter has denied the Lord three times. He recognized he denied the Lord. And he weeps bitterly. He sees Jesus raised from the dead. And I'm sure that he was excited about that. But yet still, he's still trying to figure out, so what now? John 21 for sake of time, let me jump down to verse 10. So Jesus is on the seashore, and John and Peter are out fishing, and they're in a boat, and they see the Lord from the shore, and so they jump out. Peter jumps out of the boat and swims to shore to meet him, and he's excited about it. He told them what to do as far as where to put their, their nets so they have a great catch, and they pull the net of fish in, and there's 153 fish. In verse 10 here, Jesus said to them, Bring of the fish which you, which you have now caught. And Simon Peter went up, and he drew the net to the land of full of great fishes, 153 of them. And for all there were so many, yet was not the net broken. And Jesus said unto them, Come and dine. And none of the disciples dared ask him, Who are you? Knowing that it was the Lord. So there must have been something just a little bit different about him for they wanted to say, are you the Lord? But they dared not because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus then comes and takes bread and gives with them the fish likewise. Now, uh, this is now the third time that Jesus showed himself to his disciples. You know, sometimes we're really hard-headed. <laughs> Took three times for them to get to the place of really getting to understand this message. You are hard-headed as well. You say, not me. Oh, yes, you are. You're a hard-headed bunch sometimes. And the Lord, and I'm not talking about with me. I, mean, I don't mean me. I'm talking about with, with the Holy Spirit. Sometimes the Holy Spirit's like, I've been talking to you for years. How, I mean, how many times does it take, right? Three times it says that he had showed himself to them. And uh, after that he was risen from the dead. Verse 15. So when they had died, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, He's getting ready to answer the question. He says, do you love me more than these? Now, this is you've heard me talk about this revelation that I had once before, and it was from a precious dear friend that, that I ministered to in prison for a long time. And I had preached a message, something along this line. I mean, not, not this, but something that had to do with John chapter 21. And I referred to that, do you love me more than these, as do you love me more than the disciples? Now, that's kind of an insulting thing, isn't it? If I, if I came up and I said to Marco in front of all of you, I said, Marco, do you love me more than these? Marco might say, yes. But then Debbie would stand up and she'd say, what are you talking about, Jack? I live with him. You don't love him more than me. And then Pastor Wells might say, whoa, wait just a minute now. What do you mean you love him more than me? I love him as much as you or more. In fact, I love him more than you. What, I mean, that could cause a stir, right? So he wasn't asking them, do you love me more than the rest of the people? Now, what was Peter before he met up with the Lord? He was like Dave. He liked to fish. <laughs> Isn't that right, Dave? I mean, he didn't have like the rod and reel, you know, all those, I don't know what brands. I don't even know a brand. I'm not... A, Fishermen. They didn't have that. You know, they fished a little bit different way. But Peter is a fisherman. So when the Lord says, Peter, 
Do you love me? Now remember, remember what did he say? He said, bring the fish of the 153, right? He says, Peter, do you love me more than these? Do you love me more than fishing? Now watch. You unto him, yes, Lord. You know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said unto him a second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Do you love me? And he saith unto him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said unto him, feed my sheep. He said a third time, because again, sometimes we're hard-headed. And it takes three times for you to get it. Simon, son of Jonas, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he had said unto him the third time, do you love me? Because when you ask somebody three times right in a row, it feels like that you're questioning your motive, right? Or you're questioning your sincerity. Oh, I love you. Do you love me? I love you. Do, do you really love me? How many times do I have to say it? So Peter's a little frustrated. He's grieved over that because he asked him a third time, Do you love me? And he said unto the Lord, You know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said unto him the same thing that he said the prior two, two times, essentially, Feed my sheep. So what do we do now? So what now? Because that was in the back of Peter's mind, I am assured in some capacity, maybe not exactly that phrase exactly like that, but something to that effect. What do we do now? Where do we go? What, what, was this just for a short time? Was this like, what, I mean, was, what happens now? You, you died, you raised from the dead, and, and, and now, so now what? So what do we do now? And Peter says, or Jesus says to Peter, I'm here for the answer. I have the answer for you today. And the answer is, feed my sheep, feed my lambs. See to it that people are encouraged. See to it that people are ministered to. See to it, I mean, because feeding comes in a variety of different ways. Right? We used to think sometimes if somebody didn't get saved in a service, that something, I mean, it wasn't really much of a service. Well, there's times that people get saved and we're thankful and want that. Obviously, if there's anybody that's not born again that comes into, uh, uh, you know, into a church service, we want everybody born again, right? We want people to come to the knowledge of Jesus' as saving grace. But at the end of the day, sometimes everybody in the building's saved. So we don't need you to get saved again. But what you might need is you might need some feeding on encouragement. You might need some feeding on faith. You might need some feeding on healing. You might need some feeding on love your neighbor. You might need some, forgi- uh, some feeding on forgiveness. There's a variety of things that the Bible talks about beyond salvation or that accompany salvation that we need to be fed. Because what the Bible says that uh, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So when we hear from the Word of God, it feeds our faith. And that's what Jesus was telling Peter. He says, Peter's thinking, so what now? And Jesus is saying, so this is what you do now. Feed my sheep. Feed my lambs. Feed my people. Encourage my people. Encourage them that I'm the answer. I'm the light. Go out and be salt. Be the light to people. Just be an encouragement. Help them. And I would say this. So people are going, well, what now? How, do, how does this thing get back to normal? It, it, it'll happen through me and you. Be an encouragement. Be a blessing. Help people to see that you love them. That, and, and if you love them, the only way that you can truly love somebody is the love of God flowing through you. And see, if, you, if, if the love of God is in you, then you can really learn how to love somebody. Love is not just some kind of uh, uh, adjective. You know, sometimes we think that love just means, well, you know, I just have a feeling. There's a feeling inside me. Well, the feeling is not, the feeling is not love. I mean, love can be expressed through a feeling. 
But love does stuff even when it don't have a feeling. Jesus, I promise you, Jesus didn't feel like dying. In fact, about it, in the Garden of Gethsemane, what was he doing? He was saying, Father, if there's another way, if we can do this some other way, let this cup pass for me, but nevertheless, not my will, but your will. His flesh was screaming out. He was having an opposite feeling of dying on a cross. But here's why he's your hero. is because even when his flesh was screaming out at him to do something d- different, he still yielded to it because, watch now, because love always is concerned about what's best for somebody else. Love isn't concerned about itself. And so love means you're looking out for somebody else, and that's what Jesus was doing. And that's what he's still doing here when he's talking to Peter, feed my lambs. He's thinking about there's more people that need to hear than just my disciples that, that need to hear the message. Look here. Look in uh, Mark chapter 16. Watch what he told his disciples. In Mark chapter 16, verse 14, he said, Afterward, he appeared unto the eleven, uh, unto eleven, as they sat at meat and upbraided them with their unbelief and their hardness of heart. So he's chastising them because it's like, I mean, you ever been frustrated with your kids where like you tell them what to do, right? And you think, you should have this by now. You, you should know what they, you don't have to ask me. You know, you know the answer to this. You know the response to this. But yet, they do it over and over again and you're like, ha, oh, ha. What is wrong with you? How long does it take before you get this? It was kind of like what Jesus told them when he was on the boat in Mark chapter 4. And they woke him up and they come down and they said, "Uh, Master, don't you care that we perish? And he's like, how long do I have to be with you? How is it that you have no faith? Why are you so afraid? So it's like you can feel his frustration Just like we get frustrated sometimes with our kids or people around us that we're like, my God, how long does it, how much, I mean, how much does it take to get this message across to you? So this is what he's feeling when he says, he sat there and upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. So they'd come back to him and they had said, we saw the Lord, he's been raised from the dead. And some of them were like, yeah, right, right. Uh, I don't think so. We know one in particular. What was it that Thomas said? He said, unless, unless I see the print in his hand and uh, the, uh, the, 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 the hole in his side and I can thrust my hand into it, he said, not, I couldn't believe. He said, I will not believe. I won't believe unless I can see and and take my hand and thrust it into his side. Of course, you know the story. Jesus kind of was like, okay. He shows up in the middle just with that wall. It'd be like the doors don't open, but all of a sudden he's there. And you see him and Jesus goes, Thomas, come over here, big boy. You can almost hear the Lord. I mean, we act like the Lord is like he never gets frustrated. He got frustrated at times with these guys. That doesn't mean you don't love them. Frustration doesn't mean you don't love them. He's just like, gosh, how long do I have to be with you? I mean, you should have this by now. He comes over to Thomas. He goes, Thomas, put your finger in the print of my hand and thrust your hand into my side and be not faithless but believing. But watch this. But blessed are those that believe who've not seen. So he's, he's, he's dealing with their unbelief here. And, and he said unto them, now he's given them the answer to the question. So what now? What do we do now? He said unto them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Go into all the world and preach the good news. And he says, this is what will happen. And he that believes is baptized and is baptized shall be saved. But he that believes not shall be damned, and these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils, they'll speak with new tongues, they shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them, and they shall be sick, 
and they shall recover. He says, so in other words, when you do your job, when you're questioned, so what now? He says, I can tell you what to do now is go into all the world and preach the gospel. So what, So for us, what now? Go out and be a witness. Be a blessing. Share Jesus with somebody. And it's different for different folks. The, the, the presentation of Jesus is different maybe for me to someone else than it is from you to someone else. You can reach people that I can't reach. And other people can reach other people that, that I can't reach. And I can reach people that you can't reach. Everybody has something, some way that they have influence on somebody, and it's not always behind a podium. In fact about it, usually, usually when people come in and get saved, it's because somebody else has already been working on them prior to that time. So when they come in, they're already kind of on the edge anyway. Somebody's been ministering to them, talking to them, encouraging them. They come in, and then something is said, and it's like, that's all I need. And then they respond. So we act like sometimes another, well, that's a fine preacher. He gets them saved. You get them here, I get them saved. No, it's like, look, it, it's usually just very little. It takes very little because somebody else has been doing the work. That's where he says, go into all the, gospel, go into all the world and preach the gospel. Now, was he just talking to the 11? Watch. He's talking to the eleven. He says, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And he that believes and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believes not will be damned. And these signs will follow them. Watch. These signs will follow them that what? Now notice he didn't say, and these signs will follow the disciples, you disciples, you boys. These signs will follow you all. He didn't specifically say, you eleven. He said, these signs will follow what? them that what believe. believe so in other words he's saying if you can get this one to believe then these signs will follow that one that believes and if you get one to believe and if that one that believes gets somebody else to believe and he gets someone else to believe then these signs will follow them that believe in other words it's a repetitive process and it just keeps going on and on and on and on and so that is our so what now so what through all this Find somebody just to encourage. Find somebody to share Jesus with. Find somebody to share the name of Jesus. I told you I've gotten to the place to where I use, I'm try, I try to use the name God less and Jesus more because lots of people relate to God. And that can be confused. When you say Jesus, there is no confusing that. There is no, you know, misunderstanding who we're talking about. Amen. Now, one more place. Luke chapter 4. Let me get there and I'll try to wrap this up. So, so what now? So what do we do now? Luke chapter 24. I'm going to jump over to verse 46, guys. I didn't have that in my notes, but that's where I need to be. Luke 24, verse 46. And he said unto them, Thus it is written, Jesus speaking, And thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day. Now again, he's trying to tell them, he's trying to answer their question, So what now? It behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem, and you are witnesses of these things. So what do we do now, Lord? And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry you into the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. Now he said something here that was very difficult to hear. Because when we have the, the mindset of so what now, it usually means like, man, I'm ready. So what do I do now? What, 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 what do we do? Come on, I, I need to know. And Jesus says, wait. Wait? 
What do you mean wait? Wait? Now, I, I find it interesting that sometimes people that get baptized in the Holy Spirit today with the evidence of speaking in tongues, they, they in, in some of the uh, uh, just times in the past, we've looked at this and like, you need to tarry. Now, that's not what he was saying to us today. Let me just, let me just say this, be clear. If that was the case, we need to go on, if we want to be totally scripturally accurate, then we'd need to go on to Jerusalem. Man, it got quiet. He said, Terry, you here in Jerusalem until you be what? Endued with power from on high. So if you wanted to be totally accurate, you'd have to say, well, we need to get, man, I want to be filled with the Holy Spirit, so let's go to Jerusalem and tarry, right? Your thinking is, I can feel you like you're attacking me right now with your thoughts. <laughs> he wasn't telling us to wait. He was because the Holy Spirit had not been unleashed yet. So he's saying the Holy Spirit is going to come, and when he comes, he's going to endue you with power, and then, he's, and then he shows us in just a minute. I'll show you one more, just one more place. Then he shows us what's going to happen with that. So he's not telling us to wait. He wasn't saying wait and tarry and wait till you know, a, a, a special moment happens. He was telling them, wait until the Holy Spirit comes. He hasn't come yet, but I'm going to send him. Remember what Jesus said? He said, it's expedient for you that I go back to the Father or else the Holy Spirit won't come. So that's what Jesus is saying. He said, when I, come, when I leave, then I can send the Holy Spirit and he is like Jesus personified in everyone. The difference was this. Jesus can't physically, couldn't physically touch every single person on the planet. He was limited to a body. But once he died for our sins and, and was able to redeem us with the blood of his innocence to the Father for our sins, then at that point, now the Holy Spirit can be released for me and you. And everything about the Holy Spirit is perfectly in line with Jesus. So he comes and lives on the inside of us. That's how that we have, you know, you ever had people tell you, I have Jesus living on the inside of me. Or you've told somebody, I have Jesus living on the inside of me. Why? Or how can you say that? Did, how did he fit in you? I don't know how big Jesus was. I mean, I imagine he was about 5 foot 11, about 200 and... No. I don't know how big, I don't know if he was 5'11 or 6'2 or, or 5'10. I don't know how big he was, and I don't know how much he weighed. I bet he weighed a little less than me. But, but he, you can't fit another person inside of another person, right? But, the whole, but you're thinking about it naturally. It's the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God comes on the inside of you, which personifies everything that Jesus is, was, and will be. And so he now lives on the inside. He says, but you need to wait. So what now? What do we do now? What, what's going on? What, 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 what do I need to do? Wait in Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. Now, Luke, or uh, uh, John, uh, Acts, I'll get it in a minute. Acts chapter 1. which Luke is the writer here. He says, so he's referring back from Luke 24, right? So he says in verse 1, The former treaties have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach until the day in which he was taken up after that through the Holy Ghost had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive, after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them 40 days and speaking of things pertaining to the kingdom of God. So he's in that 40-day period in Luke chapter 24 where he was telling them, wait, I'm going to show you what you do, but wait. And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem. Why? Why were they not departing from Jerusalem? Because what did Jesus say? Wait. But 
Wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, You have heard of me, for John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, will thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And again, and again, it's like, What's wrong with you? Why do you not get? Are you still looking for like he's going to come down from heaven and sit on an earthly kingdom, an earthly in an earthly throne? They still haven't got it here. And he said unto them, "It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put in His own power." In other words. Uh, when you don't understand what's going on, when you're asking the question, so, so what now? So where do we go here? Where do we go from here? When you're asking that kind of question, just think of this. It's not for you to know the, se- the times of the seasons which the Father has put in his own power. Some things, it's just none of your business. Your business is not to figure everything out. Your business is just to obey. Your business is to trust God, trust His Word. Is this too hard for y'all? I mean, I've been kind of like ready to unleash on y'all. <laughs> Verse 8, watch this. He, sp- he says, But you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you. Now watch this. And you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem, in all Judea, in Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. And I would argue that Ashland, Kentucky could be qualified as the uttermost parts of the earth. (laughs) Witnesses. What did he say to to Peter in the book of John 21? So what do we do now, Lord? Peter, do you love me? Yes, feed my sheep or feed my lambs. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know all things. Of course I love you. Feed my sheep. Feed them with message. Feed them with witness. Feed them with information that lines up with the Word. That's what he's saying. He's saying... I didn't come here to do everything. I came to redeem you so that through you, through the person of the Holy Spirit coming in you, I can do the work through you. Does that, does that, does that make sense? He's saying, I, I, know, I can't. Let me, just, let me say this. If Jesus had not willingly given up his life, you know he would not have died, right? Couldn't. The Bible says that death enters in by sin. So in other words, if Jesus does not sin, which he didn't, he can't die. He wouldn't have got like old age and, 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 and died of natural causes. He wouldn't have gotten cancer. He wouldn't have got coronavirus. He couldn't die because he doesn't have sin. He's not even susceptible to to disease because he doesn't have sin. But Jesus knows this. Physically, yes, did he change some people's lives? Did he heal them? Sure, but it was only temporary because a physical healing lasts only so long unless they can get redeemed. So if if Jesus healed somebody, it lasted for a while. But you know, every, every, let me give you a little, a little revelation here. Every single person Jesus healed is dead. In the Bible. I'm not talking about today, because you might have gotten healed. You might go, I'm still alive. I think. Am I in some alternate universe? And all this isn't real? That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about in the Bible. When, G, when Jesus, you remember when they... Uh, uh, the lady with the issue of blood came by and touched his garment. You remember when Jesus went to Jairus' house and, and he laid his hands on Jairus' daughter and she was healed? She's raised from the dead. And so if you get raised from the dead, you get healed, right? Or you die again, right? Do you know Jairus' daughter is not alive right now physically? She is dead. So 
Jesus in body could do some things. He could do some things, but it was all temporary. And he, you think he didn't know that? You think God the Father didn't know that that was all temporary? That should tell you how much compassion he has for you. Even though it was only temporary, he still wanted to do it. Right? So he knows it's only temporary. So in order for it to be a permanent thing for you, he knows that he has to die so that he can go present his blood in the whole our sacrifice so that we could be redeemed so that we are forever capable and able and eternally able to go into the presence of God and be with him but then once he dies and offers the sacrifice of his blood his sinless blood then the Holy Spirit can be sent to live in each and every one of us that exemplifies everything that Jesus is because everything Jesus is the Holy Spirit is they're all one different functions but one and he says through that if you'll receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit what what happens through the baptism of the Holy Spirit what's the one thing that I mean I'm all in favor of I, listen I, I'm, I believe in the Pentecostal experience like, I mean I, like nobody's business I believe in it I believe in speaking in other tongues I believe in all of that but what's the one thing that I mean really that you can count on that when you're baptized in the Holy Spirit and the Spirit of God comes upon you like that what's the one thing that you know is going to happen for sure a power to be a witness and that's what he's, I believe what he was telling the guys. I believe that they were saying, Lord, so what? So what now? So what do we do now? Where do we go from here? What's this? What's going to happen now? We, we followed you. We watched all this stuff. We thought you were going to be like, you know, on a throne with a scepter. You know, we thought that was the way it was going to look. And then you're going to rule the world. And then they watched him die. And they're like, I don't really get it. And he goes, no, here's what you didn't get. I died so that you could live. And in your living, the Spirit of God can come in you, and you become a witness to me, and you can lead other many thousands, millions of people into the kingdom of God. So what now for us? Mid, I don't know if we're, I don't know where we're at. I don't know if we're, we're not pre, okay? So I don't know if we're mid or post coronavirus. Okay, but, but what do you do? Mid coronavirus, post coronavirus, what do you do? Come on now, don't make me tell you three times. Because then we're going to be, I'm going to start calling you Peter. <laughs> you be a witness. Thank you, Marco. You be a witness, right? What are we going to do? So what now? So what, what do we do mid coronavirus? What do we do post coronavirus? We be a witness. We take the opportunity to be a witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Praise God if you would bow your heads. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful and grateful for the privilege, one that we should never take lightly, to be able to be assembled together, being in, in your presence. I am so thankful, Lord, to have the opportunity to share this message in person to these folks. Now, Lord, I know that there's still many people watching by Facebook, and we are so appreciative of each and every one of them as well, that, Lord, this message, it's a message that whether you're in person or whether you listen to it, it, it it's relevant everywhere. Our desire, Lord, is to be a witness, to be able to fulfill the answer to the question of so what now? We want to be witnesses for you. We want to have an influence among other people so that they come to the knowledge of your saving grace and what a wonderful Lord that you are and the desire that you have for our people, for your people, to be ministered to, to be given a chance to receive eternal life in their belief in you. So, Father, I thank you for helping me to be able to minister this word, bringing the words that I needed to be able to speak to come into my mind and my heart so that I could speak them out in a way that I believe and I hope 
was effective and is effective in, in encouraging every single person that has heard this message. So, Father, we praise you for it. We rejoice in being able to come back together again, and we don't take it for granted. We know now that it, it isn't something to be taken for granted. And our desire, Lord, is to continue to be able to do this. Now, Lord, I pray for every person that's in this building. I bind every sickness and disease that would try in any capacity to come upon them. I bind you in the name of Jesus, and I command you to leave this place. You have no place, no right to stay here, for the presence of God is greater than any sickness, any disease, because the Bible says that greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world and anything of the one that's in the world. And so we bind every foul demonic work trying in any way, any capacity, to bother any of our people in this church in the name of Jesus. Now, Father, I thank you also for the safety of our community, the health of our community. I pray for the people of this community that they would recognize the most, there's, there's things worse than dying. It's worse to die and not knowing you. And that, Lord, even though we want everybody to live as long as they can, we also know that we're not going to live forever physically. In this, in this particular life, we know that, Lord, we'll live eternally with you, and, and there's great things about that. But, Lord, the most important thing that I want people to see is their relationship, their commitment to living for you. And so I pray, Father, for opportunities to share your word. Give us opportunities, Lord, that we look for opportunities and help us to have the words to speak that will come out of our mouth that will be an influence upon people within our community. And we thank you, Lord, for helping our community with all the struggles and problems that we've experienced. We've not given up, and we believe, Lord, that you're helping us all the time. So we bless you today. We honor you. We thank you for your mighty and wonderful presence. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen. Praise the Lord. God bless you guys. Thank you so much for being with us today.